All righty. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay, great. And are the slides moving? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, so we are going to speak about pediatric dentistry. It is the specialized area of dentistry limited to the care of children from birth through adolescence with additional focus in providing oral health care to patients with special needs. Um, they're treated in a pediatric dental setting or in a general office. I will say this, that if you go to a pediatric office, there's a lot of pictures of maybe the aquarium, the zoo, the sky, you know, they paint the office real pretty. Um, so a lot of like playful stuff. So you really have to like kids if you wanna be in pediatric dentistry, trust me. The pediatric dentist uh, will continue his or her education for an additional two to three years after dental school. The program of study and hands-on experience will prepare the specialist to meet the needs of infants, children, adolescents, and, and persons with special health care needs. Okay, so he sees all those people, and at a certain age when he thinks he's uh, you're ready to go, he'll be like, see ya. And now the dental assistant, uh, pediatric dentistry provides a clinical practice environment where you will have an active role in the patient's dental care. Many pediatric dental offices employ the certified dental assistant to provide preventative procedures that are legal in that state. So one of the things that you guys will be doing a lot in a pediatric dentistry is uh, coronal polishing. Okay, um, a lot of coron a lot of coronal polishing, a um, lot of fillings, you know, simple little fillings. Um, we talked about endo the other day, so possibly some pulpotomies, and we'll get a little bit more into that. So this is where endo comes in, but on baby teeth, um, it's usually they try to save them as many times as they can. Uh, also sealants, a lot of sealants, okay? And sometimes we do a lot of preliminary impressions. Um, we take impressions, especially if maybe we're gonna send them to ortho, or just to see the growth of their mouth. Um, don't forget, uh, children only have 20 teeth in their mouth, and then they have what's called a mixed dentition. They'll go in the stage where they have baby teeth and adult teeth mixed together. That's called mixed dentition, okay? And don't forget also that if you do go in pediatric dentistry, the baby teeth are in letters, okay? So A, B, C, and so on and so forth. Now the office, as I mentioned already, you know, it's uh, different things and it also displays a lot of cheerfulness in a pleasant environment with a non-threatening decor. Treatment areas are designed with an open bay concept in mind. Dental personnel dress in bright coordinating colors so uh, their uniforms might have uh, flowers or puppies or cats or things like that, you know, different little things that uh, will make the kids happy. This is what a open bay means. So you see how the chairs are all lined up like that. One of the reasons why we do it that way without any walls or anything in between is so then that way, if let's say the assistant has to get up to go and get something, the other assistant can keep an eye on the children. Because you know how it is. You take your eye off that child, next thing you know, they're playing with the air water syringe like a toy gun, uh, squirting the whole office, uh, playing with the chair, going up and down. You know, I give you these examples because I've seen it, okay? so. Uh, you really got to keep an eye on the little ones. The pediatric patient, chronologic age, the child's actual age in term of years and months, so however old the uh, child is. The mental age, sometimes um, they go by the mental age, the child's level of intellectual capacity and development, and emotional age, the child's level of emotional maturity. 
So a child's mental age may vary by a year or two from their chronologic age. So you you've heard it before, you know, oh, um, you know, your child looks or acts older than what he really is, you know, so it has a lot to do with, um, you know, upbringing too and how smart the, uh, the child is. Now, you may encounter physical, mental, emotional, and behavioral differences between boys and girls and between children of different cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds, okay? So you will have to, you know, basically, you will treat the child accordingly. Erickson's stage of development, learning basic trust. This is the period of infancy through the first year of life. The child is well handled nurtured and love and develops trust and security and a basic optimism if handled badly the infant will become insecure and mistrustful learning autonomy during this period children learn to sit stand walk and run vocally they progress from babbling to using simple sen sentences socially they learn to identify familiar faces and alternate through periods of being friendly and being fearful of strangers Around the age of two years old, children begin to have basic fears associated with separation from the parent and a related fear of strangers. What does autonomy mean? It is the childhood process of becoming independent. Play age. The child needs to be allowed to develop autonomy and initiative. The child requires control and structure in his or her environment. The child is able to follow simple instructions. The child welcomes an active role in the treatment experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. The child's role is to help by following directions and sitting still, keeping your hands by your side, and opening your mouth wide. School age. This is a period of socialization. The child is learning to get along with people. The child is learning the rules and regulations of society and the child is learning to overcome fears of objects and situations. Now, they have learned that situations usually are less threatening than they had imagined and that generally they need not be afraid. When they reach adolescence from age 12 to 20, this young person acquires self-certainty. They experience with different roles. Clear sexual identity is established the adolescent will seek leadership and gradually develop a set of ideals. The uh, adolescent is acquiring his or her own identity. Behavior management. The initial examination is important for both the child and the dental team. This is often the first dental experience for the child. The report developed during the initial examination can establish an attitude toward dental health that will last for a child's lifetime. Many dentists will follow a behavior scale early in the treatment of a pediatric patient. Dr. Spencer Frankel, he developed one of the most widely used system, which is called the Frankel scale, to measure a pediatric patient's behavior. And if you look in your uh, Kindle or your Red Shelf book, uh, under table 57.1, you'll see the Frankel scale. Now, guidelines for child behavior. Be honest with the child. Consider the child's point of view. Use tell, show, and do, and give positive reinforcement. Now, I have to be real honest with you. These guidelines for children, a lot of them you have to use for adults also. You have to be honest with them of what you're going to do. Uh, you also have to, you know, consider their point of view because to them everything is scary. So whether to me, whether it's a child or an adult, they're scared of the dentist. A lot of times we do have to tell, show and do like, you know, um, when I take x-rays on a child, I say they don't really know what x-rays is. So I might explain it like this. I am going to take x-rays. It's just like a camera and it's going to take pictures of your teeth. Okay, so you have to uh, explain it to them in a way that they, you know, understand. They know pictures. I mean, a lot of children nowadays have their own phones, you know, and adults too. Some of them, if it's their first time going to the dentist, you might have to explain it like that also. Now, 
Words that unnecessarily evoke fear in the child should be avoided. I've told you guys that before, especially like when we were loading the syringe. I said, don't use the word needle. Needle scares everybody, okay? Uh, the syringe alone, you guys know when we put it together, it turned from a small little thing into a giant thing. And for uh, children and adults, it's humongous. So you have to be careful. What would, what words should we use? Anesthetic. Uh, for a child, if they still don't understand, um, you could say, we're going to give you something to put your mouth to sleep. They understand to sleep, okay? Uh, the dental team should not assume that a procedure or instrument is so harmless that uh, it will not concern a child because, again, uh, you don't know what scares them, okay? So tell, show, do is very important at this age in preparing the child and eliciting the appropriate cooperation. Do not reward undesirable behavior. So that's another thing. Most um, pediatric offices have little prizes at the end when they finish. Um, they get to pick a toy in the treasure box or wherever they put uh, the toys. And um, we should only be giving it to the children that behave good, okay? Because then you give them to the ones that didn't behave so great, they're going to continue behaving that way. Now, the challenging patient, sedation, this is prescribed to calm the patient and put him or her at ease before treatment. Nitrous oxide oxygen, oxygen uh, the method of mild sedation can help calm a patient for treatment. Physical restraint, restraints are used to prevent injury to the child and dental team. Now, voice control is really important. You want to speak calmly but firmly. We'll usually prevent the need for additional steps. Of course, you don't want to yell at them, but if you need to, you know, tell them to stop touching maybe the handpiece because they might get hurt. You know, you have to say it firmly, like, don't touch that. You might get hurt. You know, you have to let them know not to do it and the why not to do it, okay? Now, for young toddlers and preschool age children, a parent may be asked to help keep and under control. And the reason why we might use physical restraints or something called um, a papoose board or uh, we hold their hands, um, it's really, it's a device, by the way, a papoose board. Uh, you should have a picture of it inside your Kindle. It's excellent for the younger child who's been sedated or for the patient with special needs who may have limited control of his or her movement. We really don't like to restrain anybody, but there are some children that can't help themselves. And so we might have to. Again, it's all for their protection so they don't harm themselves. Patients with special needs, intellectual disability, you have your mild IQs ranging from between 50 to 70, moderate 35 to 55, severe 20 to 40, and profound 20 to 25. Now, severely to profoundly mentally challenged children and adults typically undergo dental treatment under general anesthesia in the operating room of a hospital. A lot of times, um, the pediatric dentist has a, uh, he has access to the hospital and when he can't see certain patients, he will schedule them at the hospital and we would put them under general anesthesia. In that case, a lot of times you or somebody in the office will be called the traveling assistant where you will travel from office to office. I mentioned also in uh, oral surgery, they do have traveling assistance also for endo. Not that he necessarily works in a hospital, but uh, a lot of endodontists work in different offices. Now, oral surgeons can work in a hospital, pediatric can work in a hospital. So again, if you are chosen, you, uh, you are known as the traveling assistant. You do get paid a little bit more to travel or you get your mileage paid. Now, Down syndrome, this disorder is, is called trisomy 21. Down syndrome is a chromosomal aberration resulting in abnormal physical characteristics and mental impairment. 
Mental impairment may range from mild to moderate retardation. A person with Down syndrome is affected by low muscle strength and weak muscle tone. Heart conditions are possible. An affected child may exhibit abnormalities in dental development and periodontal problems are possible. And if you remember from our lecture, imperio, perio is gums, the tissues. So what happens is if they're not brushing their teeth prob properly, yes, even children can develop periodontal problems, okay? And I've seen it. And this is why it's important for us when we get that young child in our office, we need to educate not only them, but their parents. Because believe it or not, um, I did a, a health clinic fair one time uh, for the community, and we just did simple brushing and flossing. And um, I had a couple of parents ask me what the rope was for. And I was like, rope? What rope? And they were like that, and it was they were pointing to the floss. And I was like, oh, this is floss. And then I said, well, let me show you. And we had typodons, and we showed on the typodons how to and we gave out floss. We showed how to brush. Uh, people were not brushing, uh, uh, again, both adults and children. Because if the adults don't know, guess what? They're not going to teach the children correctly. And sometimes if the adult doesn't want to be in the, um, in the operatory with the child, then you let the child know. When you go home, teach everybody how to brush their teeth. And the children will do it because the children are, are really good in, oh, look at what I learned and um, let me show you type. Okay, so you want to make sure that, uh, again, we have to educate. Now, what dental and periodontal issues are commonly seen in patients who have Down syndrome? What special procedures may be required for treatment? Eruption of teeth may be delayed with the primary incisors not erupting until after one year of age. Teeth may be small and peg-shaped, often with malocclusion. Periodontal problems are common uh, because of malonine teeth, mouth breathing, or poor dental care at home. So I mentioned poor dental care, but it's also other reasons too. The forward position of the mandible and undeveloped nasal and maxillary bones do not provide sufficient space for the tongue. The resulting open mouth forward tongue position gives the appearance of an enlarged tongue. Dental treatment will depend on psychological uh, development and physical problems. The patient should be approached in terms of mental age and abilities, not in terms of chronologic age. So now you see why we went through the chronologic, mental, okay, physical, things like that, because even though a child might be 10, their mental might be five. So you have to go back a little bit and treat them like still like a five-year-old, okay? So you guys have to determine that. And if they're not getting it, then you have to explain it a little bit more. Autism is a development disorder that affects how information is processed in the brain by altering how nerve cells and their synapses connect and organize. The patient may exhibit behavioral problems with management difficulties. Patients who have autism have a known desire for sweet foods and generally have poor oral hygiene. So now you put sweet foods, so foods, candy, things like that, and poor oral hygiene together, what do you get? Cavities, okay? So again, proper education, both of the child and the parent. In this case, probably more the parent, okay? So the dis disorder is characterized by an inability to get along with people, poor social skills, lack of interpersonal relationships, and an abnormal speech and language. These patients are at increased risk for uh, dental caries and for periodontal disease. Cerebral palsy. This non-progressive neural disorder is caused by brain damage that occur prenatally during birth or postnatally before the central nervous system reaches maturity. It is characterized by paralysis, muscle weakness, lack of coordination, other disorders of motor function, or poor oral hygiene. So cerebral palsy most often is classified according to the type of motor disturbance, 
There's two most common types, fasity and athetosis. Why might oral hygiene be a problem at home for patients who have cerebral palsy and what home care aids are available? So oral hygiene, and you're going to keep hearing this. It's not, it, it's not only in the children that have disabilities, it's everybody. There's so much poor oral hygiene out there, it's not even funny. And one of the reasons why is we're rushing what we're doing and we're not educating. We need to stop and really make sure that the patient understands us. So oral hygiene in most patients with cerebral palsy is poor, in part because of the nature of their disease and the resulting physical limitations. The patient and the caregiver should receive a thorough orientation to a home care program with modifications as necessary to meet the uh, patient's special needs. Frequently, an electric toothbrush can be used effectively. Special ad adaptations of toothbrush handles and other aids to hygiene also may be helpful. Um, you know, nobody has to buy an expensive electric toothbrush. There's some out there that cost five dollars um, and they do the job just as well. OK, uh, but again, it's all about making sure that we're teaching the patient not to only brush the outside of our teeth, which is the buckle and the facial surfaces, but the inside on the lingual. So many patients miss that. The occlusals where we chew on, okay? And not to mention the fact, we must start at the gum line and work our way down. A lot of people miss uh, the plaque right around the gum line. And then of course, you know, it gets complicated and at, the longer it stays there, then we're talking about calculus and perio disease. And then again, we also have to mention flossing. So if they're having a hard time holding the floss, there are special aids out there that there's uh, floss holders. There's um, just like I showed you the other day, there's floss threaders. Uh, there's different, there's a water flosser. I love my water flosser. Okay. You can use a water flosser. Um, and with the water flosser, I like to put water and um, scope or whatever you guys like to use, any type of mouthwash. And as I'm flossing my teeth, it's shooting water in between my teeth with mouthwash. I love that stuff. Granted, it gets my glass in my bathroom all dirty, but it does the job. All right, diagnosis and treatment planning. First appointment should take place around first birthday. So regular examinations begin at age two. Now, does everybody bring their child uh, to the dental office at two? Nope. You know when they bring the child to the dental office? Who can tell me? Who do you think? Who can uh, figure out when do you usually bring a child to the dental office? Nobody. Usually, huh? Uh, no. I, did you say five? Yeah. Not at five. Anybody else has um, before the first birthday? Well, they should bring them for their around their first birthday. But what I'm saying is, is that a lot of parents don't bring them to the office until guess what when when there's a problem they have cavities. right when they have a toothache when they fall down and break a tooth and so think about this you have a child that's in pain and uh, maybe they were in school they got i don't know they fell in the playground they hurt themselves now their tooth is in pain you bring them to the dental office not only are they in pain, okay, but they're scared because you just brought them to the doctor's office. They don't like the doctor either, okay? And so now that experience right there is going to uh, scare them even more because number one, they're always going to associate going to the dentist when they were in pain. This is, again, why it's so important that it should be around their first birthday. Now, do they remember? Probably not. And do we do a thorough check? No, we're just kind of looking, you know, just to like get them 
used to the surrounding areas. And then on a yearly basis, we'll tell them keep bringing them. And you know what happens? They start getting used to the dental office. So God forbid something happens in school or they hurt themselves and you have to bring them into the dental office as an emergency. They're going to be like, oh, Dr. So-and-so, I know him. Okay, no problem. So now that level of pain has gone down a little bit because now they trust the person they're going with. So again, it's so important that they are taken around their first birthday or around the age of two, and then you continue from there, okay? Uh, parental consent must be given before any dental care is provided for persons younger than 18. So I've mentioned that to you guys before. Parental consent um, for definitely for children, but we need consent from everybody. Don't just jump into a procedure and think that it's okay until you speak to the patient. So what they're there because they had a three o'clock appointment. You know, half of the time they're like, what are we going to do today? And you're like saying to yourself, really? You're the one who scheduled the appointment. The thing is, again, they tend to forget, especially if they have a lot of work that's needed. So today you're going to say today we're going to do two fillings on the upper right. Do you have any questions about that? And then, okay, well, here's a consent and I need you to sign it. For the child, you want to make sure that, you know, not only are you explaining it to the child, but you don't get them to sign the consent. The, the consent has to be signed by a parent, okay? So again, a lot of times the first appointment is just scheduled to collect information, introduce the child to the dentist and staff and to help the child feel comfortable in the office surroundings. We might even give them a little tour of the office and show them a little bit of how everything operates. You know, that's usually where we just show the mirror. We don't even show the Explorer and the cotton pliers, okay? Because even the Explorer looks a little bit scary. It also gives the dental team an op opportunity to educate the parents on preventative techniques and pediatric care. So again, we should be asking What's the routine at home? Uh, are we brushing after every meal before they go to bed? Are they flossing? And you know, you're going to get a lot of patients saying, don't you, don't you think that they're a little bit too young for flossing? Well, you know what? There's no time like the time that they start getting teeth in their mouth to show them flossing. And if you show them correctly, by the time they, they have their permanent teeth in their mouth, they're going to be pros at it. And that's what we want. We want to make sure that they're pros, okay? Medical and dental history. We want to make sure we get past hospitalizations and surgeries, date of the child's last visit to a physician. Medications, that's really important. Check and see if they're having any medications, daily medications, any reactions to any medicine, allergies. What was their weight at birth and any problems at birth? What's their level of learning? The main concern about the child's dental health. Uh, do they suck their finger, their thumb? What's their pacifier habits? Fluoride and toothbrush habits. Inherited family dental characteristics. Okay, so we need to find a little bit more information out. So that way we're better prepared for the child when they come to their first dental appointment. You want to ask about and record regular or as needed medications such as asthma inhalers, vitamins, antibiotics. Parents may forget to mention all medications, so even though they uh, fill out the medical history, kind of make sure. And then just once in a while, just check with the child because you know what? Sometimes you're like, do you take anything during the day? And the child's like, yeah, mommy, I don't know the name of that medicine. What is it called? And they might mean a vitamin or something, you know? I take my vitamins every day. So believe it or not, the child, um, a lot of them, as you may know, are little tattletailers. So they'll tell on their parents, oh, they forgot to mention this type of thing, okay? Initial clinical examination. So when they come in, we're going to take the x-rays, okay? So radiographic imaging, extra oral examination. The doctor will look on the outside along with the intraoral soft tissue examination. And you guys will be doing the charting of the teeth. So again, I mentioned to you that charting is in letters, okay? 
There are 20 teeth, but we chart in letters. And then we write uh, everything on a, this one call, is called the dental report card. We, you know, some pediatric offices have it, not everybody has it. And basically, you know, kind of lets them know how they're doing, you know, what's their score for today, you know, because some little kids, they understand report cards. And so, you know, we might do any recommendation, home care improvements. If they have to go and see the orthodontist for braces, okay. If they have to come back for whatever treatment, um, cleaning, things like that. So we usually give them a little report card. And, um, and at that time, too, we'll ask both the child and the parent if they have any questions. Nine out of ten times, they say no, okay. Uh, preventive dentistry for children, oral hygiene efforts are geared to improve a child's brushing and flossing technique, fluorides. Children between the ages of six months and 16 years should uh, take in fluoride daily. Fluoride varnish is being used for caries prevention on a routine basis. And diet, we review the specific nutrients a child needs to grow. Okay, so we would tell the parent nutrition snacks should be eaten instead of sugary snacks, chips or soda. Um, you know, if, if they do drink soda, you know, cause I know a lot of parents do let their children, um, drink soda. We want them to either brush or drink water afterwards. So the soda is not in their mouth because the sugar stays in their mouth. Okay. And that goes for anything sugary that they eat, especially those sticky, uh, foods like your fruit roll-ups or your gummy bears and things like that. Um, Demonstrate proper frosting, flossing and brushing techniques during the office visit. Provide constructive feedback. Depending on the type of water consumed by the patient, fluoride supplements or fluoride toothpaste should be recommended. Uh, the doctor will let you know um, if, you, if he wants um, extra fluoride. He'll let them know to let or let you know to let them know, okay? Now, sealants. Here's another thing. These are applied to pits and fissures to help keep them cavity free. Oral facial development, malocclusions, crowded or crooked teeth, and bite problems must be identified and the dental staff must intervene. Sports safety, protective equipment should be worn during any recreational sport that might injure the mouth area. So when you come back to lab, once we do our checkoffs for uh, endo, oral surgery, uh, we're going to do a little bit more profi and sealants, okay, in this mod. So make sure you uh, read the procedures if you haven't to make sure what to do and what to expect to do. Why is early evaluation of oral and facial development important? Early preventative and interceptive orthodontic treatment can pre prevent the need for more extensive treatment later. So again, um, we uh, sometimes in the office too, we uh, make the sports uh, guard, the mouth guards. But to be honest with you, when children grow so rapidly, uh, those things in the office can cost about two fifty to five hundred dollars. Uh, in the stores, they sell them for like twenty five dollars. Are they a good fit? Not really. They're a one size fits all. But because the child grows so fast, it's better to buy those. Um, instead of making one that fits in their mouth and then in a couple of months it won't fit because the teeth move around, okay? So uh, after preventative, our next chapter is also, we'll talk more about the crowded and the crooked teeth, the bite problems, um, and then also about the sports safety, uh, the mouth guards and things like that. I'll show you some of that. Now, pediatric procedures, restorative procedures, anesthesia and pain control, use of the dental dam. So you guys already know the identity of the dental dam. Now, instrument size. You guys should have already noticed that some instruments are the same, but some of them are smaller on one side and bigger on the other side. So we do use the same instruments as we would use on an adult, but we would just use the smaller side. We're going to also practice matrix systems. We talked about endodontic procedures, okay, so pulp therapy and pulpotomy. Prostodontic procedures, we'll get a little bit more into that, those stainless steel crowns and the types of crowns. 
Um, again, what's the difference between a pulpotomy and a root canal? A pulpotomy is a complete removal of the coronal portion of the dental pulp, whereas a root canal is a treatment used to repair and save a tooth that is badly decayed or becomes infected. Uh, during the root canal procedure, the nerve and pulp are removed and the inside of the tooth is clean and sealed. Now, there are some dental traumas that you may see in a child, like fractured anterior teeth, again, from falling, getting hit in the mouth. Traumatic intrusion, okay, so traumatic intrusion is when a child does fall and the tooth is pushed back in its socket, all right? Extrusion and lateral luxation injuries. You should have some pictures in your Kindle. Unfortunately, the PowerPoint doesn't have any, but you should have some pictures. Let me just make sure. Oh, never mind. Let me go to it. That way I can go a little bit deeper into it. So fractured anterior teeth. Of course, we document everything, clinical examination, radiographs, and vitality testing. Remember the pulp tester that you guys need to identify in your uh, endo uh, setup? We will use it for this tooth right here. Okay, the fractured one. Our control tooth would be the one next to it. So we would test both to know how this one tests, and then we would test this one to see if it has the same reading as this. But I'm going to tell you right now, this tooth is so fractured that it probably would need a root canal. And the unfortunate thing is, is that this already is the permanent tooth, okay? So, you know, to save a permanent tooth, we have to save it because after a permanent tooth, there is no other tooth. You know, if it was a baby tooth, then we're like, okay, we have the permanent tooth coming in. But when it's the permanent tooth, we have to do a couple of things to it. So if this tooth is salvageable, it would need a root canal. If the pulp is involved, a post and core buildup, and finally a crown, because we're not going to leave it broken like that. Um, again, it all depends too, because can the parent pay for it? Uh, you know, all three things that I mentioned are kind of expensive. All right. Remember, I told you rucanas are expensive, and then all the treatments afterwards. If they have insurance, thank God, hopefully they do. Uh, insurance pays for uh, some part of it, whether it's 80, 50, whatever percentage coverage that they picked, okay? And again, we also make sure that not only, even though this one is clear that it fractured, but did any of the other teeth get hurt? Maybe there's a little chip here, no big deal, you know, but sometimes we want to make sure that none of the other teeth has any trauma to it, Okay. So that's a fractured anterior tooth. Now, traumatic intrusion, that's, uh, as I mentioned to you, the tooth is forcibly driven into the alveolus so that only a portion of the crown is visible. And I don't see a picture of that one. You might have it in your Kindle, though. So basically, as I mentioned before, so what happens is if the child, let's say, I use the excuse if they fall down, because usually that's when it happens. If they fall down, the tooth may be put back into its socket. At this point, we do nothing. We just let it come out on its own and we just have to keep an eye on it and make sure that um, there's no more trauma to it. If it starts turning dark, then something happened to the tooth. Dark usually represents trauma, okay? Uh, maybe needing a root canal or even an extraction depends on how bad it is. So again, we just treat the symptoms and we just let wait for the tooth to come back out. We do take x-rays on occasion and we have the patient come back like a couple of months, a month, two months, things like that, you know, just to keep on checking on the tooth. Or we tell the parent, bring the, the child back if you see any rapidly changes, okay? Extrusion and lateral luxation. So teeth are displaced from their position. Remember yesterday we talked about the word luxate. Okay, luxate in oral surgery. All right, displace. So when you have extrusion and lateral luxation, it causes damage to the periodontal ligament. And so some of the displaced teeth are repositioned. What that means is a tooth could have been in its proper spot 
And then, God forbid, again, another traumatic thing happened and the two moved to a different spot, okay? So we can do something to reposition uh, displaced teeth, but it has to be done as soon as possible. You can't wait uh, a week or two weeks or whatever out to the dentist a parent must know that if something happens to their child's tooth they have to go to the dentist right away okay and we might make what's called a temporary splint of resin material or ligature wire to reposition uh the permanent teeth do we do it for baby teeth not usually okay we don't usually uh do uh splints unless the baby tooth just recently came out because remember something too Baby teeth are meant to hold a space for the permanent teeth when they come in. We really don't want to be taking out baby teeth until baby teeth are loose and ready to come out. And how do they become loose and ready to come out? That means that the permanent tooth is coming out and ready to push it out. Okay, and that's how they become loose. We don't want to start little kids teeth just because they want some money from the tooth fairy. Okay. A vulse teeth, a tooth is torn away or dislodged completely by force. Recover the tooth immediately, wrap the tooth in a moisture gauze and go immediately to the dentist's office. So here's another, um, and here guys, I mentioned this to you yesterday. I said, look at these pictures and make sure you look at them really good and make all the faces you want right now. Look at the blood, look at the teeth, look at everything. Because we need to have a what when we're in the office. What did I say we need to have? How should our face be? Nobody remembers from yesterday's uh, lecture? What is it? Poker face. Yes, thank you. A poker face. We need to have a poker face. Come on, people. If you see this, are you going to have a poker face if you don't start looking at the pictures and stuff? No, you'll probably be like, ay, bendito. Oh, you know, you start and then now you're making the child feel really bad. You know, sometimes we will have the shock look on our face and sometimes we'll have that concerned look on our face. We need to have the poker face no matter what. We can't feel uh, bad for them, you know, though we do, but you don't want to show it. You want to do your job professionally, okay? And I mean, yeah, we do we want to soothe the child? Absolutely. We want to soothe the child, you know, we want to make them feel, but we don't want to make them feel bad because right now this is what they're going to look like for the next couple of days or whatever, okay? So in this case, if you see eight and nine has been uh, a vault, okay? So it's been torn away or dislodged completely by some type of force. Again, whether they fell down, they got hit in the mouth, car accident, whatever the case may be. Eight and nine is gone. But luckily, eight and nine fell out of their mouth completely not broken, not fractured, nothing. The whole thing from the root to the crown. In a case like that, we get those teeth. And as they say, a moisture gauze, but come on, who carries a moisture gauze in their pocket? Nobody. Honestly, the best place to put these teeth is under their tongue or back in the socket or in their cheek. If, you know, um, if we can have a, a little cup of milk, I mean, if there's no milk, then a cup of water. I mean, ultimately, if you have nothing, then yes, the teeth have to be uh, moist, though. That's the whole thing here. Why? Because as we talked about, the teeth have these periodontal ligaments, and that's what attaches, okay? We want to make sure that we keep those periodontal ligaments uh, moist, because if we put them in a napkin and the napkin is dry. What's going to happen when you open the napkin? It's going to stick to the napkin, okay? And more than likely, the periodontal ligaments will pull off the tooth and then the tooth is not salvageable anymore. So we want to really uh, put these teeth back. So immediately go to the dentist's office with the teeth, 
And then the, the doctor will clean this area eight and nine out with a curette. Now we're going into oral surgery. Remember yesterday's instruments. He will clean this out with a curette. He will clean it out with some sterile uh, water, okay? Clean it all out, flush it out. Uh, make sure the area is clean. Make sure the teeth that have to be reimplanted again are put back in place. And then they might put like a wire, like almost like uh, braces, like a wire or even composite to make sure that they stay attached. And so they put something from this tooth to this tooth to make sure they hold on to it. Or sometimes they'll make them like a little, what we call a stent. Uh, it looks like a little plastic, um, almost like bleaching trays or mouth guard to wear to keep those teeth in its place. This is another type of appointment that would, they would have to come a few times so we could see if it's healing. Now, the body will decide whether it's going to accept those teeth again or reject them. If the body uh, starts having um, infection at that area, or you can see that the teeth are not tightening up in that uh, in the sockets again, then unfortunately they have lost their teeth. If the body has decided to tighten up and keep the teeth in their mouth, then normally later on we will probably uh, do root canal in order to continue to save those teeth. We antibiotics. This is where it's crucial that we have to tell the patient and the parent that even though this area might hurt, it must be clean. I mean, super, super clean. We don't want any bacteria in there. We need it to keep it clean. They have to be gentle, of course, but we need to keep it clean. Maybe no flossing, but we definitely got to do some brushing, okay? And, and we want to do our part at home, letting them know, so then that way they can keep these teeth, okay? Um... Now, there's something else in pediatric that um, it's a very hard discussion, but it's something that has to be uh, you have as a child care, um, as a dental assistant professional and a dentist, you have to make sure that you see child abuse if it's suspected. Okay. So child abuse must be suspected when injuries are in various stages of healing. Teeth are chipped or injured. The child has scars inside the lips or on the tongue and tears of the labia frena. The child exhibits battering or other injuries around the head and neck. Facial bruising, swelling of the facial structures or black eyes are evident. The child has bite marks. Injuries are not consistent with the explanation presented by the, pa uh, the parent. Unless a state has a mandated reporter requirement for healthcare professionals, the dental assistant really has no legal obligation to report suspe suspected child abuse. This is usually the responsibility of the dentist or dental hygienist, but you can serve as an important witness. And sometimes, you know what? The children tell you more than they tell the dentist, okay? So if you do suspect, just let the dentist know, you know. Um, unfortunately, I have seen this, and I'm going to give you an example. Out here in Florida, it was a 90-plus degree weather. I received a child in the office, um, and she had sweats on, you know, like the sweatshirt and the sweatpants and um, heavy-duty socks, boots. I mean, she was dressed like for the winter. And um, I'm like, wow. I said just plainly, wow, it's, it's really hot outside. Aren't you hot? And she's like five years old and she's like, yes. So I said, well, why don't you go ahead and roll up your sleeves? And she was hesitant about rolling up her sleeves. And I'm like, it's okay. You want some help, you know? And um, she shook her head, yes. And so I helped her kind of roll up her sleeves. And what was underneath her sleeves? Cigarette marks. They were putting out cigarettes on this little child's body, okay? Uh, using her as an ashtray. She was in like a foster home. And the foster mother, and I guess the boyfriends of the foster mother, and sometimes... 
guys, you say this can only happen on TV or you see it in shows and things like that, but that was real life. And um, the only thing that, you know, like in my heart, I knew something was wrong because why would a child come to an office at uh, in like winter clothes? So things are like that is what you need to be paying attention to, okay? Um, and, you know, of course, I let the doctor know, but he would have noticed it too, you know? And um, we had to call the police, and the police came, and they basically had to take the child away from that foster mother, you know? Um, you know, so there's things like this that we have to report. Another time that I didn't like, and, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like um, working in a pediatric office, uh, but I did help out, okay, uh, for a while. So another time was when a police officer came and had x-rays of a dead uh, child that they found, and they wanted to know if that child was one of our patients. You know, unfortunately, that's another thing that you have to take a look at because you have to see the pictures to see if we can identify that child's body. Uh, unfortunately, it was one of our patients and, you know, we had to like identify the teeth. Uh, first, we recognized the picture and then we had to identify the teeth to make sure that that was the child. So, you know, things like that, I, I really don't like. Of course, nobody likes it, but I, after that, you know, I was like, you know what, enough is enough. I don't want to work in a pediatric office anymore. Um, so when you do report child abuse, you have to check, uh, you have to make sure the required information is correct. Name, address, sex, age, height, and weight of the child. Name and address of the adult with custody of the child. Description of the current abuse or neglect of the child, evidence of previous injuries or negligence, any information that may assist in establishing the cause of the injuries, sketches or photographs documenting the nature and location of the injuries. So all these things that was on here, we had to do for the uh, child with the winter clothes, okay? We had to make sure we took uh, pictures and um, uh, actually, the police and the uh, Child Protective Service that came did most of that, but we uh, also requested a copy for the child's chart, okay? And, um, you know, I wish I could say, I, I wish I could say you know, uh, how the child is doing, but I don't know, that was many, many years ago, okay? Proper documentation, including photographs, is crucial in documenting physical evidence. This information should be kept confidential and reported in a professional manner. Now, I can tell you the story, but I can't tell you the name of the child, you know. And again, um, it is just super important, so just always be aware of your surroundings. Does anybody have any questions? 